In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Brethren in Christ, Laudato Jesus Christus in Secula. This is Timothy Flanders with the Meaning of Catholic. I'm joined today by Dr. Richard DeClue. How you doing, brother? Good. Thanks for having me on. Excellent. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you on. Dr. Richard DeClue is the Cardinal Henri de Lubac Fellow of Theology at the Word on Fire Institute. He earned his STL and Doctor of Sacred Theology degrees in Systematic Theology from the Catholic University of America. And related to today's topic, he, his STL thesis discussed the relationship between the Pope, the Eucharist, and the Church in Catholic and Orthodox perspectives. And we'll be discussing today a summary of that. And your doctorate um, was in the Revelation, according to Ratzinger. What was the what was yes, your Joseph, Joseph Ratzinger's theology of divine revelation? Excellent, excellent. Um, so, what's new with the uh, Word on Fire Institute? What's going on with what you're working on? Yeah, I just got a lot of different projects going on. We'll be airing a conference on faith and science sometime in the near future. That'll be exciting. Um, got a couple courses I'll be doing in Vatican II for them as well um, in regarding the Word on Fire Vatican II collection book that was recently published. Okay, so, so, yeah. so yeah, there was a, was it a collection of the documents? Tell us about the book. Yeah, so basically, I actually got it back here. It's the, the first volume is just the four major constitutions. Okay. But what they've done is they've included like the opening address by Pope St. John the 23rd, as well as a foreword by Bishop Barron, and then inserted within the documents themselves, they've got some commentary by Bishop Barron and then excerpts from magisterial texts that quote those documents. Okay. So it kind of shows the continuity of magisterium over time regarding certain points within the documents themselves. And your presentation, is that going to be airing on YouTube or is that going to be something you can purchase? What's that? There's going to be two different courses. One, I believe, is going to be on YouTube. That's going to be more of a thematic or narrative approach to the council. And it's going to do more than just those four documents. And then there will be another course that will be following a reading plan based on that book. And that, I believe, will be open to anyone who purchases the book. They'll get free access to that course. Excellent. Okay, sweet. Well, that's that's very good. So today we're talking about our feast today, which is the Feast of Corpus Christi, the Eucharist, the dogma of the real presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. And today we're going to be talking about Eucharistic ecclesiology. What does the Eucharist have to do with the church? What is the relationship between those two things? Just a reminder to viewers, tomorrow is a first Friday. It's a great opportunity to offer reparation to Jesus Christ, to give him greater glory in the Eucharist, and to offer what you can, whether that's the first Friday devotion or an hour of adoration or anything you can. Great opportunity for that first Friday as well as first Saturday. So just a reminder for tomorrow. So let's get into our topic, Eucharistic Ecclesiology. So is this something that started to become more popular in the 20th century? Can you give us some of the background of this concept being res resourced or, or restored? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the elements of Eucharistic ecclesiology go back to the patristic era and the writings of the church fathers. And there's also elements of it that you can find in the works of Thomas Aquinas as well. When you look at his theology of the Eucharist, ecclesiology comes through in there as well. But ecclesiology as a subset of dogmatic theology was not really a separate discipline until about the 14th or 15th centuries. So, um, and then when the you had the Protestant Reformation happened, um, the Catholic ecclesiology developed as a response to Protestant notions of the church and therefore, in that time, needed to emphasize certain aspects. 
So, for instance, Robert Bellarmine is going to emphasize the church as the perfect society. And he's going to be emphasizing the institutional visibility of the church um, to counteract the idea of the church as just some invisible unity of believers and we can't know who they are. So he's going to develop that, that notion of the perfect society and the visible structure of the church, which is still a part of Eucharistic ecclesiology. But basically what ends up happening is over time, like with Pope Pius XII in his in his encyclical on you know the mystical body, um, he's going to bring back the patristic and scriptural references of the church as the body of Christ. And so you begin to see a, a deepening or really a reawakening of the depth of what ecclesiology is, what theology of the church is, that even more than being the institutional structure, it's also a theological reality. It's a sacramental reality as something instituted by God. And therefore you're just, you're not getting rid of anything like Bellarmine was emphasizing, but you're also broadening it and deepening it. And then of course it, with the race source small movement, especially with Henri de Lubac, with his book on the mystical body, Corpus Mysticum, um, he was basically tracing the development of the terminology over time. And in doing that, trying to reawaken our awareness that for the church's, you know, past, there was this intimate link between the, the Eucharist and the church. And you actually un need to understand the church through the Eucharist. And that while, yes, the church makes the Eucharist, it's also true to say that the Eucharist makes the church and showing how that goes back to our scriptural and patristic um, past. Okay, so the, the, the sort of the resourcing of the Eucharistic ecclesiology is not primarily in response to some sort of heretical movement. It's just the patristic and scriptural revival. It's restoring a lot of those concepts. Right, yeah. It was sort of a revival of things that just hadn't been emphasized in the last couple centuries. Um, there, there were still somewhat there latently, I mean, in Thomas, I mean, this isn't like it's against Thomas or anything. So you can, there's ways of using Thomas to articulate similar things, but Eucharistic ecclesiology in many ways was going back to the church fathers, partly as a way of emphasizing, um, the common patrimony of the East and the West in theology. So tell a, it, oh, go ahead. No, just say as a way of trying to tackle the, the the great schism between the East and the West, hearkening back to our, you know, what divides us, trying to tackle those things that divide us within the common patrimony of understanding the church eucharistically as something that we both have in common. Yeah, so you, you definitely bring out in this article the, uh, the, the unity between Joseph Ratzinger and John Zulus, who is a, a Greek Orthodox bishop who writes a book called Being and Communion, I, I believe it's called. Being as Communion. Being as yeah. Communion. And he's bringing out, and Ratzinger is very much agreeing with the basics. So can you break down for the viewers, what do you mean by, but let's just define what is Eucharistic ecclesiology. You said that the church makes the Eucharist, but the Eucharist also makes the church. Tell us about what does that mean? Right. So there's a couple ways of tackling this. Um, I'll try to do a quick sketch to provide context. I always think it's helpful in systematic and dogmatic theology to understand how all the different dogmas relate to one another. So part of the task of the systematic theologian is to show how this doctrine helps you understand this other doctrine. And the source and end of all doctrines is the Trinity that from which all things come and that towards which all things are ordered. And so from the very beginnings of it is that just the notion of the Trinity is a communion of persons, the one and the many. So one God, three persons, and there's this mysterious reality there that we almost can't quite grasp. But the Trinity is the source of all that exists. And it's also the goal towards everything that exists. What sin brought into the world was division. So it separated humanity from God. It separated 
people from one another, and it even destroyed the integrity of the individual human, right? So with sin, you end up getting division and disunity, disintegration. So part of salvation is then it needs to undo those divisions as well as elevate the nature. So there's a twofold aspect there. You're restoring the unity that was lost, both between God and man, between people with one another, as well as with in reintegrating the individual human soul. Christ, of course, is what brings that about through his incarnation, death, resurrection, ascension. So by uniting the divine and human back together, he becomes the source from which our unity, reunion with God, and also with one another comes. So he gives us, it's through our incorporation into Christ, primarily that this, all of these things get healed. And through this vertical communion that Christ gives us with God, there's a simultaneous unity of us who have been incorporated into Christ as his body. And of course, this happens first in baptism, but then of course, there's three sacraments of initiation, which culminate in the reception of the whole of Holy Communion. And the heart of Eucharistic ecclesiology really, or the, the basis of it can be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where St. Paul talks about how we, though many, are one body because we all partake of the one loaf. So that's the basic idea, is that we become the church, the body of Christ, by receiving the body of Christ. And this is Aquinas' understanding as well. By receiving Holy Communion, the communion that is the church is also created and strengthened. And so there's this sacramental understanding of the church as really taking place through the reception of Holy Communion. And so we understand the church so thoroughly Eucharistically that it's actually why the church makes a distinction between what it calls churches and ecclesial communities. Without apostolic succession, which is a requirement for valid celebration of the Eucharist, um, you can't be church in, in the real sense. That without the Eucharist, you don't have the church. The church is almost first and foremost the celebration of the Eucharist. That's And it's in the holy sacrifice that the church is most herself. So that's basically what Eucharistic ecclesiology is emphasizing. It's this fact that, you know, you don't just have a bunch of people that get together and make themselves church because they have like similar thoughts on things. That's not what church is. So it's not just a collection of like-minded people who happen to agree in their interpretation of scripture or the faith. It really is a sacramental reality that is created through the gift of God in the sacraments. And that, it's the body of Christ, Jesus giving us his own body that unites us as the one body. Yeah, let, let me read that uh, scripture that you made reference to. Um, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a communion in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a communion in the body of Christ? Because the loaf of bread is one, we though many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. And I, I thought of the Didache uh, for viewers. The Didache is the one of the earliest written documents after the New Testament. The mm -hmm. Didache is also known as the teaching of the, of the apostles. And in chapter 9, it says, concerning the Eucharist, and then it, it, it says, here's how you should pray the Eucharistic prayer, um, or the canon, shall we say. And then it has in that a, pet a petition that prays, even as this broken bread is scattered over the hills and was gathered together and became one. So let your church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. So um, you have some great quotes here discussing that. And I, I had mentioned to you, Ratzinger says, can you elaborate on what is said here? Because you, you included the German. And I'd love for you to elaborate on what is meant here. So Ratzinger sure. says this, he says, according to the fathers, Eucharist and church do not stand as two different things next to one another, but fall thoroughly into one another. 
What does he mean by that? Right. So he's basically saying that the church fathers had a very, you could say mystical, but you could also say sacramental. You know, there's that a mystery is a sacrament. Those are just two different terms for the same thing. And that we understand the Eucharist as this, it's this full reality. It's, and Aquinas talks about this too, but basically that the, what's, what's happening in the Eucharist is there's mul there's many layers to it. Yes. The consecration takes place where the, the species end up becoming transubstantiated into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Right. So we, we've got that reality. Um, and that sacrifice is being offered, and then, but our reception of Holy Communion is actually affecting this unity with Christ. It's not like we're only bodily consuming the host; we're we're also being transformed by it and brought into a real mystical union with Christ, and thus also with everyone else who is being mystically united with Christ. So it's. And that is therefore generating the church, so to speak, as the body of Christ. And so the reception of communion, as we have to remember, one thing we have to try to avoid is an overly individualistic view of these things. Because as I said, part of salvation is restoring the unity that was lost through sin. That's why the creed itself talks about the communion of saints that's in the creed. Well, and it's really the obviously all the sacraments of initiation, but most especially the Holy Eucharist that makes us the communion of holy ones in holy things. And so that the, the Eucharist is actually creating the church. And so there's this, there's this inseparable unity between the real body of Christ and the Eucharist and the mystical body of Christ that is the church. And they're sort of being brought into this real mystical unity. And so they're not separable. You can't just talk about, okay, well, that's the Eucharist, which is Jesus. And then here's this, you know, institutional structure over here. That's the church as if, as if they're completely separate realities. It's no, this whole reality is being brought into a mystical union so that the church really is the mystical body of Christ through the Eucharist. Does that have anything to do with reconciling with your brother before you bring your offering? Can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, especially there, you know, even now, right, before we can receive Holy Communion, we have to be in a state of grace, right? Because if we're in a state of, of mortal sin, we have damaged ourselves and the body of Christ, the church, through our sin. And we are now outside of the state of grace. So there, there has to be some base level. That's why baptism comes first. And then if you've fallen into grave sin before communion, reconciliation, to restore yourself to being in communion with Christ, which is then elevated and perfected to a, a greater degree through the Holy Eucharist. And so, yes, if we're divided from the church, our brothers, um, through our sins, we need to have this reconciliation um, before we partake in the fullness of the sacrament of communion. I wondered if you could comment on um, the petition that I, I was talking to you about before we went on the air, because I have always, it's, it's always been a little puzzling to me, but maybe this is what's going to make sense out of it, is the Eucharistic ecclesiology. So if, if anybody, if any viewers have the like the Angelus Missal or the Father Lassans Missal or the, um, I know the new mass has the same prayer in it too. It's the, it says the prayer before communion of St. Thomas Aquinas. And in that prayer, he has this petition uh, that I may be found worthy to be incorporated into his mystical body and forevermore to be numbered among his members. And that kind of puzzled me. It's always puzzled me because, you know, I thought that I was already a member of the church. So why am I petitioning? at the Eucharist to be made a member of the church. Is that sort of this mystical, greater deepening union that you're referring to? Is that what he's talking about? What do you think? Right. Yes. And because the Eucharist is going to full, fully incorporates us, but then also 
you know, frequent reception of Holy Communion obviously has a continuing effect of sanctifying. And we need, also need to be remaining in that church. And so it's, it's, it's almost like a renewal of the covenant, right? Where it's receiving the Eucharist is constantly keeping us incorporated into the church through the grace of the sacrament. And it's strengthening that bond, which is why frequent reception of communion is so important. Um, because without it, we can, you know, allow our sins to start making us drift away and separating ourselves from, from the mystical body. And again, part of the reason we understand the church is necessary for salvation is precisely because it is the mystical body of Christ. It's, it's both the effect and the instrument of Christ's saving humanity. And so it's, the church is not something that is separate from salvation. <laughs> it is both a part of the effect of Christ's saving work as well as an instrument that brings it about by incorporating people into it. And so salvation is ecclesial in many ways. It is communal in that sense. And we as individuals need to be grafted into and incorporated into that body as part of our salvation. Yeah, that definitely speaks to the fall thoroughly into one another. Um, is that the... I believe the phrase from Vatican II is this church is the sacrament of salvation. Is that the phrase? Sacrament. Well, there's, there's three different expressions, but yes, the sort is the sacrament of salvation and unity of all peoples. So meaning it's the sign that's an efficacious sign <laughs> that accomplishes what it signifies. So it is a sign of salvation that also affects salvation in the world. And it's a sign of the unity of, of peoples that affects unity of peoples. That's, you know, referring to the fact that the church is, it's not located or delimited by one ethnicity or race or anything, that it is, it's Catholic in that sense of universal. And so it's a sign of this unity of all peoples with one another and also affects that unity by bringing them into, in making them one. Can you speak on what you'd mentioned a few minutes ago the holy ones in the holy things. I remember reading in um, Yaroslav Pelikan years ago where the medievals were discussing the Sanctorum communi Communio, meaning it's the community of saints and the community of holy things together. And then I'm thinking of the Greek rite where it says the Hagia are for the Hagiis, the holy things are the, for the holy, the holy ones. Uh, can you speak on what is the meaning of, of this, of holy for the holy ones? So in, in talking about the, the church as a communion, right? You have different levels of communion. You have communion, as Bellarmine would say, the communion of, in the profession of faith, which the profession part shouldn't, should, needs to be emphasized because for Bellarmine, when he's saying it's communion in the profession of faith, it's because that's visible and sensible. It's not just some vacuous communion in faith that's sort of out there somewhere, but communion in the profession of faith, which is why we say the creed, right? Um, and in the sacraments, so in the reception of the sacraments, and in hierarchical governance. So there's these different elements of the communion that we have as the church. And so I believe he specifies those three things. So part of our communion is, of course, believing and professing the same faith, but also our communion in the sacraments. And so the fact that we all commune and we all receive baptism, confirmation, Holy Eucharist, you know, obviously reconciliation as well. Um, that's part of this communion that we have. It's of the holy ones and holy things. So we have been sanctified through baptism and also through like, confession, which enables us to receive the holy things, most especially the Eucharist. So we were also communing in that reality. Let me read another. Uh, so this is, um, <clears throat> this is Azulis talking from your article. He said, he defines the Eucharistic ecclesiology like this. In as much as the Eucharistic assembly incarnates and reveals in history not a part of the one Christ, but the mm -hmm. one Lord himself in his entirety, 
who takes up the many in himself in perpetuity, in perpetuity in order to make them one and bring them back through his sacrifice before the throne of the Father. What we have in the Eucharist is not a part of the church, but the whole church herself, the whole body of Christ. Thus, ecclesiological fullness and Catholicity of the church sojourning in each place form the first and basic consequence of the unity of the church at the divine Eucharist. Would you say that uh, on the base, on the, uh, what is the, is this statement from a Greek Orthodox bishop entirely Catholic? Is this entirely acceptable as, as it was just read before we so, get into the universal primacy stuff? It, it depends how you nuance it. I mean, the, so the article you're reading from the full title is I believe, Eucharistic Ecclesiologies of Locality and Universality in John Zizulis and Joseph Ratzinger. So basically, it's this comparison of Ratzinger's Catholic understanding of, of these things with Zizulis as an Orthodox. And it gets very nuanced where you're like, oh, they're saying the same thing. And then you read these other quotes going, they're absolutely opposite. And so there's all these really interesting nuances. Um, they both affirm what you're talking about. And this is the first part of that article. It's called the full, was it the full ecclesial quality of the local church, I believe, is the, the fullness of the, the full ecclesial quality of the local yeah, church. Right. Because yep. The chapter or the section heading. And both of them affirm this, that the local church, which is somewhat of a, I think particular church is actually a better more theologically correct term, but most people... And that just means the bishop, the diocese. means diocese, right. yes. Yeah. Which is, it gets interesting when you talk, when you get into the depths of these things. Um, so what they're basically affirming is that every diocese united with its bishop contains all of the essential elements of what the church is. And so it's sort of like the presence of the one church in this place. Um, now, Zizulus and Ratzinger are going to disagree on this when you get into the weeds, but maybe a helpful example would be, okay, if you have, let's say, a host in their tabernacle at one parish and a host in the tabernacle in another parish in a different diocese, right? Well, obviously this host and that host are not the same host per se, right? But what they are is the same. They are both Jesus fully present in the Eucharist, right? So even though the various dioceses or particular churches are in different locales, they are the embodiment of one reality. So they are the, the, the mystical body of Christ in this place. And so they, they do contain the fullness of what it means to be church. And in that sense, they're not parts of the church. Um, so to use another example, they're, it's not like the, the whatever diocese you're in is like a finger or a hand or even a lung or the heart, right? It's each diocese contains all of the elements of what the mystical body of Christ is. You don't have to move your residence to be a part of the church. You can just right. be in, their, in the diocese because you and have the whole not church understood there. As, yes, and they're not understood as like parts of one another because they're all contain the fullness of the same reality. It's not like, oh, well, I need that diocese over here to, you know, give me the left hand versus the right hand. Like right. each diocese contains the fullness of what the church is. Now, it's important to recognize that that can only fully the, the full ecclesial quality of the local church still requires unity with the Bishop of Rome, for instance, which is a whole other issue with the Catholic Orthodox side of it. But um, so it, there still needs to be communion amongst the local churches, which is the next section of the article gets into that quandary. But what he's saying there in Ratzinger would affirm is that the local church is church in the full sense. I mean, he contains all the essential elements of what makes it the church. And that is primarily because of the Eucharist. But you have to understand the Eucharist as primarily being presided over by the bishop, even if he's not present. 
and there's historical reasons for that we could get into, but it's so it's not the parish. Isn't even though that's where you're going to mass, the the local church is the diocese under the head headship of the bishop, not the parish under the headship of the priest. Yeah, the bishop has the fullness of the priesthood, the fullness of apostolic succession, and the priests are essentially his ministers, his vicars, who are celebrating the sacraments under his jurisdiction and with his permission, basically, with his blessing. And, um, okay, I, let me ask you about the concept of the head, Christ as head. Um, and I believe, if I recall, you mentioned the phrase of Augustine, where he talks about the whole Christ. Uh, I right, remember reading. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I remember reading this beautiful commentary when St. Augustine was commenting on the Psalms and how the Psalms, he's saying the Psalms make reference to my sins in the wording of the Psalms. And he's saying, but that, that is the, the actual, the words of Christ in the Psalms. And yet he's speaking sort of on behalf of his body, the church. And the, the church is sort of saying my sins and the head, Christ himself, is is uniting himself and taking on our sins. And can you speak to this, what is the meaning of Christ as the head and then Christ and the church as the whole Christ? Right, so you, you basically have two different analogies. And this is part of um, going back to the early centuries and even Aquinas talks about different, ways of talking about it, you, you, have, you have these different analogies that bring out aspects of the church, right, and what she is in her essence. Um, the body of Christ is one of them, and you can you can talk about the church as the body of Christ, um, with Christ as the head, and we as the members, right? Well, Zizulus is quoting Augustine. I believe the point he's trying to make is that they are mutually constitutive, Christ is Christ, and Christ is the head as the head of the body. And the body is the body as that which is attached to the head. So, you know, he's the Savior insofar as he saves us, right? So there's this mutual relation, almost the same way that a father and the son are related to one another. The father is the father in relation to the son, and the son in relationship to the father. The head and members go together. As a, as, a, as a unity. Um, you can also understand it through the, so if you look at like Romans and I believe Corinthians, you're going to have more of the discussion of the, the head and members in just talking about the, the body analogy. If you go into like Ephesians and Colossians, this analogy is going to be further discussed in relationship to uh, marriage. So the body and bride of Christ, right? So you can also understand the church as the body of Christ the same way that you understand a woman to be the body of her husband, right? Um, the, the husband being the head, the two become one flesh. So the, that's another helpful analogy. And I think you'll see in, in Ratzinger, he tends to develop it in that direction because he wants to maintain the unity in distinction between Christ and the body. I mean, obviously we are not Jesus. We're not this incarnate second person of the Trinity, but through this mystical union, the church as the bride of Christ united to her bridegroom, the head, who's her head is therefore one body with Christ. There's now this unity of, in, in, of inseparability um, that takes place. I don't know if that helps answer the yeah. question. Yeah, well, my friend yeah. Anthony goes right where I wanted to go next. So he's saying, so if the Orthodox have valid sacraments, are they technically part of the Catholic Church according to Eucharistic ecclesiology? There is a, there is some degree of unity. And I know this is like a hot button issue amongst people right now. But no, because again, remember, you've got communion in the profession of the same faith. We've got some dogmatic differences, right? profession, um, communion in holy things, the ability for Catholics and Orthodox to have inner communion is very limited to very specific circumstances and is not generally allowed apart outside of those. Like danger of death. Yeah. Right. Danger of death or lack of ability to receive, to, to access to your own church. And even then sometimes it's not mutually allowed. 
um, and in hierarchical governance. But we would say that theologically speaking, because they have apostolic succession, they have their bishops are validly ordained, their priests are validly ordained, and therefore they their consecration is valid, right? So they are really celebrating the Eucharist. So there is, that's why we can refer to them as churches in, in that sense, because they can, because they have the valid Eucharist and the Eucharist makes the church. Yes, we can say that they are churches in some sense, but no, they're not in full communion with us. So this is why, this is why the schism is so lamentable because we've got this tremendous overlap, if you will, but without the fullness in profession of the same faith, communion of, and in Socrates and, and holy things and governance, we are not united as one. So there still is this de facto schism taking place. Yeah, you mentioned um, dogmatic differences. Ave Christus Rex is wondering, is rejection of the Filioque and the Orthodox doctrine of the papacy just heresy? And how is that distinct from schism exactly? How does heresy well, affect participation in the body? Right. So to make a distinction between heresy and schism, um, looking at in the code of canon law, um, heresy is a post-baptismal denial of some revealed truth that must be believed with divine and Catholic faith. So that's what heresy is. Heresy is a, is a, and it's obstinate. So it means you've been corrected a number of times and you're still refusing to, to recant your rejection of this dogma. That's what heresy is. Um, Schism is a refusal to submission to the Roman pontiff or refusal of communion with those subjected to him. So you could technically be not be a heretic, but still be a schismatic. So they are different things, schism and heresy. Um, yeah, the, the difficulty is I think that obstinate piece, because I, I mean, yeah. most... I would guess that most Orthodox, you know, haven't the faintest idea, like in the, you know, Russia, yeah. like Russian peasants, they haven't the faintest idea about all this filioque stuff. You know, they don't really care. They're just trying to work out their salvation. So um, I don't think that we could impute uh, obstinate heresy to them. If, if maybe they have material heresy or something like that, if there's something passed down, I think it's, I mean, in my experience, it really depends on the each individual Orthodox Christian. There are Orthodox Christians that I know, who are fully on board with everything Catholicism. You know, they're pretty much, I have no problem with Catholicism. I don't know why we're disunited, that type of thing. All the way to Orthodox who are saying, well, Catholics are heretics. You know, Augustine was a heretic, all sorts of crazy things that they can sometimes say. So um, let's see. So I well, let me ask you this, because this, this goes right into, speaking about the Orthodox, it also goes into modern controversies i you you mentioned casper and ratziger and how they went back and forth and now mm -hmm. we're we're in uh there are some in the church who want to make the local church sort of ontologically primary to the universal church or they think that the local church can sort of change dogmas um and i think they can draw on some eucharistic ecclesiology some of these concepts you can borrow from the Orthodox and sort of push this sort of thing. Can you comment on any of that? Yeah. I mean, it almost, if you read through the whole article, a lot of this becomes more clear. Um, but part of what it requires for the local church to be fully church, fully Catholic is that it, it maintain the faith and it must also maintain communion with the whole church, the universal church. And that is basically through the communion of the successors of the apostles. So the, 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 the college of bishops with the Bishop of Rome as their head. So that's part of what's required for a local church to be fully church is its unity with Rome and thus with the universal church. So you can't really separate them out. Um, 
the local church cannot change dogma binding on the entire universal church. So every local church is bound by dogma um, of the universal church. So they have to maintain those same things. You can't just kind of go off and do what you want. Um, that's part of maintaining that unity, which is why the Bishop of Rome is important in this because he, the, the bishops being in communion with one another is a testimony to the fact that they are officially holding to the same faith. Um, so that's a, a major part of it. If you, if you, if you start having some local church or synod or whatever, that's rejecting things that they're bound by, that's not that's not allowable in this model because maintaining that unity is essential to being church even in, in your own locality yeah i i found the the note you have from the cdf um commit what is it communionis nozio on questions regarding i think it's communion but it's, it says this, this, so this is Ratzinger talking through the CDF in an official document. And he says this, it is precisely the Eucharist that renders, renders all self-sufficiency on the part of the particular churches impossible. Indeed, the unicity and indivisibility of the Eucharistic body of the Lord implies the unicity of his mystical body, which is the one and indivisible church from the Eucharistic center arises the necessary openness of every celebrating community of every particular church by allowing itself to be drawn into the open arms of the Lord and achieves insertion into his one and undivided body. And you, you mentioned later that um, the primacy of the Pope does not primarily concern either orthodoxy or orthopraxy, but ortho Eucharist. Can you elaborate on what you mean by ortho Eucharist? Yeah, I believe that was a quote from my thesis director, Monsignor Paul McPartland. Yes. Who was okay, quoting yeah. uh, Batista Mundine, I think, M-O-N-D-I-N, I believe. So yes. that was his yeah. phrase that, um, so because the, the essence of the church is so closely tied to the authentic celebration and reception of the Holy Eucharist, that the, the primary role of the papacy is to maintain that unity in the Eucharist. So it's almost even, it doesn't mean that, I mean, obviously a part of that unity, you have to pro be professing the same faith and doing the same things, pra praxis, right? So faith and praxis are important, but the primary role is to keep united the individual celebrations of the Eucharist as united with one another because it's it's objectively a, a bad situation when you have Eucharist, the Holy Mass, the or the Divine Liturgy being celebrated, not in communion with the whole church. That's because it's already objectively not what it's meant to be. Because that that unity of the of the one church throughout time and at the same time is an integral part of what the Eucharist is and so in some sense you can understand the role of the bishop of rome as a point of unity that's this outward expression of but also making visible the reality that all of these various celebrations of the eucharist throughout the world are united as one reality because if, if a local church is not united with the universal church, then their celebration of the Eucharist might be valid in a technical sense, but it's already flawed in not being the celebration of the universal church. And therefore, there's a defect there. You're celebrating the Eucharist, but you're not celebrating it in union with the whole church. But union with the, with the whole church, as we mentioned, is part of what the Eucharist means. This Dorkaus or this thoroughly falling into one another thing we were talking about. That's why in the patristic area you'll, you'll see, you know, um, references to no, only consider that Eucharist as valid, which is celebrated by the bishop or the one to whom he delegates it. Right? That there's a, a an objective 
the, the Eucharist is the celebration of the Eucharist is failing to be what it is if it's celebrated apart from the unity of the church. And so part of his role is to maintain this unity of the very celebrations. Yeah, the, the Bishop of Rome is like a, a sign of universal charity among the faithful, that the faithful are unwilling to break charity with one another and break their Eucharistic celebrations, unless, God forbid, there is a breakage of truth. When And then, like what you're saying, if there's a breakage of truth, there's a breakage of the profession of faith, then you've already broken the, the foundations of the unity of the Eucharist, which both right. creates and confirms. And you could argue that part of the reason the Pope has a is has the role of protecting the unity of the faith is so that the the profession of faith in the Eucharist can be the same, so that the orthodoxy is a requirement for the proper celebration of the Eucharist. So, but it's it's so that they can celebrate the Eucharist properly in some sense. So it's his other tasks are geared towards this one highest task, which is maintaining ecclesial or Eucharistic communion. And um, Ratzinger actually, you mentioned this, the charity thing, right? Oh, well, he's, you know, he talks about how they talk about, oh, well, he really presides in charity. He goes, okay, but the Eucharist is the sacrament of charity. So he, he really does see the papacy as a, a Eucharistic office. It's not something completely segregated from the Eucharist, which is why this Eucharistic ecclesiology approach to the papacy, I think, is so important. Because what you tend to see in the Orthodox is the emphasis on the local church so much. They're saying, well, we already have everything. We don't need some other structure outside of us to be the church. Ergo, we don't need to be in communion with him. And he, Ratzinger is trying to argue, no, that's not the case. Because your celebration of the Eucharist is tied to this universal communion of the church. So. Yeah, I think of St. Paul saying, how can the hand say to the foot, I need, have no need of you. It's just Christians should be uniting. Uh, Christians who are of the same faith should be uniting in charity. That's what a Christian does. Right. And if you're celebrating the Eucharist, you should be uniting with other Christians celebrating the Eucharist. I want to get to a few more questions here uh, before we wrap up. Um, mm -hmm. Where was that? Something about transubstantiation and consubstantiation. Okay, here it is. Um, with Catholic, okay, Catholic Lutheran intercommunion in Germany. Can you explain the necessity of transubstantiation compared to consubstantiation or general spiritual presence? Why is transubstantiation essential? One, I don't think it hasn't been allowed, has it? The intercommunion? I don't know. I don't know. I can't comment on should, whatever intercommunion may be going on in Germany. Yeah, that, I don't know about that. Happening, my guess would be it's not sanctioned because one we couldn't even recognize their Eucharist as valid because we don't recognize their apostolic succession. So even if they believe in consubstantiation, for instance, we couldn't authenticate that, that it's actually taking place. So that's already a, 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 a big issue between Catholics and Lutherans because without apostolic succession, you can't celebrate the Eucharist validly and so we could never affirm that that, you know, is the reality is present there. So that already is another issue. Um, the the consubstantiality versus transubstantiation issue. I, the reason it's important is because the church is is declared on these things. The church has to be united on these things. And so if you're not affirming what the church is affirming, then you're lacking that communion in faith in the profession of faith. So with the Catholics and Lutherans, you have the twofold issue. One is the apostolic succession required to validly confect the Eucharist. And the second is the, the understanding of what the Eucharist is. So how is transubstantiation, 
transubstantiation necessary for the Eucharistic ecclesiology. If you believe in like the Lutherans, like consubstantiation, just for yours, consubstantiation is actually, it is a, a type of real presence. Right. So they actually believe that there is the real presence of the body of Christ. If you're, if you're a hardcore Lutheran, very, very few Lutherans right. actually believe yeah. this anymore, but Luther did believe that consubstantiation, meaning there is the substance of the body of Christ, but it exists together with the substance of the bread. Whereas we believe mm -hmm. transubstantiation is the substance of the bread is gone. Now it is only the substance of the body. So what is the importance of transubstantiation for Eucharistic ecclesiology? Couldn't the Lutherans just, you know, create a Eucharistic ecclesiology out of consubstantiation? I mean, you can create things. <laughs> the, the question is whether the reality matches what's in, again, you know, adequation of mind and reality, right? So it's, you know, I don't, whether transubstantiation versus consubstantiation is, is intrinsically important distinction for Eucharistic ecclesiology or not, maybe not, but the unity in the faith is. So when something is a dogma of the faith, Rejecting it creates a problem. And again, also believing, you know, there's a difference between believing that the Eucharist is, is, is Jesus and it actually being so as well. And again, not anyone who decides to be a minister can or transubstantiate the elements into, the, into Jesus. So, you know, there's, it's, that's, another area where that would be affected is without apostolic succession, you can't have valid Eucharist. So the real communion isn't taking place. Yeah. I, I, I mean, my, yeah, my initial thought of besides what you just said, yeah, obviously you can't just create the Eucharist and just say you have apostolic succession. It doesn't make it, make it happen. Um, I think of transubstantiation as as a far more mystical mystical act. Uh, you know, we offer cultus, we offer we offer worship to the Eucharist as God, as Jesus mm -hmm. Christ Himself in the flesh. Um, the Lutherans, it's a little bit different if you believe that the bread is still there, because then you're worshiping the bread with Jesus together, and then how do you separate that? Because then. It's transubstantiation seems to accord far more with the hypostatic union of God and man in one person, because then the bread itself, the accents sort of are, are one person with Christ, if, if, so to speak, if that's possible to say. But uh, anyways, um, Anthony says, I see a real understanding of holiness in the Orthodox Church. How can they have that and still have no salvation? Well, I'm not sure i claim they have no salvation so i mean that's already an issue there um how do okay so how do you divide these things up there's always objective and subjective dimensions right like when we talk about to be guilty of mortal sin that has to be objectively grave done with full knowledge and deliberate consent so something can be objectively grave, but if you don't fully know and you didn't really deliberate on it and make the choice anyway, it's not a moral sin, right? So you can talk about people not being subjectively culpable for things that are objectively defective. Right. So that might be the best way of trying to approach that. Right. The, there is the dogma of no salvation outside the church is objectively true on the objective level, but we can also say hypothetically that subjectively speaking, some may have some sort of mysterious union with Christ <clears throat> or the church due to God's operative grace, drawing all to salvation yet through the church at the same time, because all graces are working through the church impelling towards Catholic unity. And right. so there's sort of this mystery and, and it's kind of, I, there's a, the, what was the phrase from the phrase from Vatican II regarding the Orthodox is something it's, I think it's partial communion is the term. I, it's some, it's not full communion, but it's some, some sort of communion 
So there is a communion. And I think what, what I, at least what I've understood that to be is simply that, you know, we don't rebaptize Protestant Trinitarian, you know, they have a baptism, which is then incorporated. So there is something of Catholicity among them. And so we're not denying that we're not rebaptizing them all and reconfirming all the Orthodox and everything. Um, when I, when I was Eastern Orthodox, I came to community with Rome. All I did was receive the Holy sacrifice. I didn't actually, I didn't, um, get reconfirmed. So I didn't receive a new sacrament. Um, so there is already God working. There's no such thing as Protestant baptism. There's just baptism. It's just Catholic. Um, here's a, let's see, what was the, oh, here, here's a great, great question to end us out. Can Dr. DeClue explain the role of the Eucharist with union with God the Father and the Holy Spirit, not merely union with Christ, but the entire Trinity too? Yeah, that's and that's basically why at the beginning I kind of went a little bit out of bounds on, on the topic and tried to start with the Trinity. Because what I was trying to emphasize is the, is the fact that everything in in our in dogma, in systematics, all of that is all linked to one another. Right. So I started with the Trinity for that reason, because the Trinity in the communion that the Trinity is, is the source of everything and is that towards which everything is is ordered. Through sin, right, we've separated from God and one another and our, even our own integrity has been damaged. So salvation involves this undoing of that damage in all three of those levels. Christ, as the incarnate word, the eternal word, God the Son, fully God, fully man, has reunited divine and human natures and thus given us access to for man to be reunited with God. And when I say God, I mean the, the Trinity, right? It's God the Father through the Son and the Holy Spirit, right? So He's reestablishing that connection. It's through Christ that we get reconnected with the Trinity and the Holy Spirit is even sent, right? I will, we just had Pentecost. <laughs> I will send the spirit of truth. So, um, and then it's, that happens in the concrete through the church and even more concretely through the reception of the sacraments. So in baptism, confirmation and Holy Communion. And so it's through these sacraments of initiation, we are brought into unity with Christ in the Holy Spirit, which unites us with God the Father. That's why we're offering, I mean, if you think about it, at, at the divine liturgy, the sacrifice is being offered to the Father. And so this it, union with Christ is union with the Trinity. You can't be united with Christ and not with the Father and the Holy Spirit, right? The Trinity is, is one God. Um, so yes, it's a very important point. This is, and that is the goal of, of all creation, if you will. And that's why salvation is this unity. And there's a great line from Ratzinger in principles of Catholic theology. I, just side note, introduction to Christianity gets a lot of press and it's a great book and highly recommended, but very few people seem to know about the later book that Ratzinger wrote principles of Catholic theology. Um, I think it's fundamentals for, a, or foundations for a fundamental theology. Um, but in that book, he talks about how belief in the Trinity requires the communion of the church because what we believe in is the is a communion of persons. The communion of persons is part of the of that who believes. So there's there's this unity between the object and subject of faith the Trinity being the object of faith, the church being the subject of faith. So the one who believes is a communion of persons, which is a reflection of the, the communion of persons that the Trinity is. And so those two things go together. Beautiful. Yeah. I, I think of the whole Eucharistic, the, the Roman canon is an offering of Jesus Christ to the father and uniting ourselves. That's the Eucharist uniting ourselves to, the sacrifice of Christ to the Father, which is entering into the Trinitarian relationship. Well, right, and we're getting sanctifying yeah. grace through the Eucharist, which, you know, the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us and we're getting the fruits and all those things. It's it's all linked. 
yeah, the, the whole thing is thoroughly Trinitarian in that sense. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing. I, I've got your channel and your blog linked below. Any final thoughts for us? No, I just think um, it's important for us to, to take time. And I appreciate you having me on because I think as people get very bogged down in everything that's wrong with the church and the world and everything, we need to take these times to take a step back and reflect on the depth and beauty of our faith and what we're given that we're not owed. And the fact that the church, despite the flaws of her members and even some her leaders in many ways, we are receiving this most august gift of the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, which is bringing us in union with the Holy Trinity and thus with one another and the communion of saints. And we don't deserve that. And we need to be grateful for that. And that's Part of why I think Eucharistic ecclesiology is so important is because it brings so many different aspects of the faith into one mystery. And um, so, yeah, that's yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, received but not deserved. That is that is what we need to be contemplating today. I, of course, the Eucharist, the term means Thanksgiving mm -hmm. and focusing on gratitude at a time like this is a great thing for a Christian to do. So thank you very much for uh, your teaching and uh, that great message. So let's offer up an Our Father. Uh, just once again, reminder, tomorrow is the first Friday, so great time to offer up your gratitude to our Eucharistic Lord. If you want to support this apostolate, Mean of Catholic, you can go to patreon.com slash Mean of Catholic. And once again, you can see Dr. Richard DeClue's work below, linked at his channel and his blog. So let's offer up an Our Father in gratitude for this immense gift and a gift of faith that God has given to us undeserved. And I've got this, uh, my wife found this great painting for the thumbnail. This is from Miguel Cabrera from uh, 1500s or something, mm. but uh, it's a be it's beautiful painting of the Eucharist. I'm gonna make it big here. All right, let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Hmm. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus is King. Amen.